Good morning, I'm Lauren Laflam with Bankers Insurance and welcome to our webinar on Core Human Resources Systems Every Business Needs. Presenting today is Jamie Hasty from Sesco Management Consultants. We've partnered with Sesco for many years and since 1945, Sesco has provided human resource and employee relations consulting to companies across the country. If you're a client of ours, we encourage you to take advantage of your access to Sesco. This webinar is being recorded, and I will share the recording with everyone at the end of the webinar. We will also have a Q&A session at the end, so please submit your questions using the chat feature as they come in mind. With that, I'll turn it over to Jamie Hasty, Vice President of Sesco Management Consultants. Thanks, Lauren. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be back with you all to talk um, a few things regarding core HR systems for proper onboarding. Now, there are a variety of necessary HR systems um, that we use um, for every organization, regardless of size. But for pur purposes of today, we're going to talk about the very, very basic core systems um, Sesco, as Lauren noted, has been in business since 1945, and um, we do a lot of auditing of clients, auditing of their systems, auditing of their files, um, representation with the DOL, whether that be federal or state. And so this webinar is really intended to give you kind of the, the basics of what I run into and what I consult my clients on, on what should and should not be there, what I'm looking for, and what you need in place to best protect the organization. So we're going to start off with personnel file documentation and record retention, um, and then we'll roll into onboarding for new hires and why the employee handbook is such a critical HR system. Um, I will field questions at the very end of our time today, and I will make sure that Lauren gets a copy of the PowerPoint to share with you all so that you have that for your records. So first things first, there should be three HR quote unquote files. <laughs> um, you need to have a general personnel file, a separate medical personnel file under lock and key, not behind your general file, not in the same folder as your general file, not even in the same drawer as your general files. OK, and I'll dig more into that here shortly. And then you should always have your I-9 separated. Now, a lot of organizations are utilizing HRIS systems, which is wonderful. Um, so within that system, you just want to make sure that those things are obviously separated out under lock and key as well and password protected as well as backed up for disaster recovery processes. So when I'm looking in the, the personnel files, when I'm auditing files for clients, First thing that I'm looking for is an application for employment. It needs to have an EEO statement, an Equal Employment Opportunity Statement. That should be at the very top of your application. That should cover all of your protected classes, have language in it that obviously we are um, not going to discriminate in the screening and hiring process, course of employment, so on and so forth. Then I'm looking at uh, history of employment, dates, uh, where did they work? What was their rate of pay? Um, depending on what state you are operating in, you may or may not be able to ask compensation history. OK, um, so you need to be mindful of state regulation there. Obviously, we're looking for professional references, um, conviction history. Again, certain states do prohibit that on the application of employment. Here in Virginia, that only is applicable to public sector employees. Private sector employees can absolutely ask about conviction history. Um, however, friendly reminder, you can't use conviction history in your decision making process unless that conviction is tied into um, the job. So, for example, if I'm required to drive as a main function of my job, then yes, a DUI conviction could prohibit me from doing those essential functions of the job. However, if I'm not required to drive, then that conviction history really should not be used in the determination. That's a DOL rule, okay? I'm also looking for an active period. There should be language at the very back or the last page uh, right above where they sign that talks about 
this application will remain on file active for X number of days, after which, if you want to be considered for employment, you must reapply. That is there uh, for a variety of reasons, but to ensure that this application is not indefinitely active, this helps negate somebody coming back a year from now and saying, oh, well, I applied, but you didn't consider me for this open position, even though that wasn't the position that I applied for. OK, um, the next thing that I'm looking for is our notice to applicants. That's a requirement under the ADAA. Um, that's going to apply to employers with 15 or more. And it basically is just a disclosure statement that says if you require a reasonable accommodation through the recruitment process, that you will notify the, an individual in human resources. They may need assistance with pre-employment testing or modifications or reasonable accommodations for the interview process. And so ADA requires a notice to applicant. <clears throat> I'm also going to be looking for a resume or CV. Um, that does not replace an application for employment. We want both. We're looking for interview notes. It is not an uncommon situation where I'm auditing files and there's a resume, but no interview notes. Well, I need to know why this person was hired. Um, so we typically always recommend behavioral based interview guides and questions and friendly reminder, never write on an application or a resume. Those things are discoverable. An application once it's signed is a legal document. Um, which is why I want an interview guide. I want all of the notes to be on the, the interview guide. Um, at the very least, if you're going to put a sticky note on something, that's better than stapling a, a note to a resume or an application. OK, um, if you are in an industry that has pay plans, commissioned employees, um, typically in automotive um, sales, those sorts of things. Um, I want to see a signed written pay plan that's in accordance with the Fair Labor Standards Act. Employees need to understand how their bonus or commission structure works. OK, also offer of employment should be a best practice. Um, what position are they being offered? What's the rate of pay? When are they going to start? What benefits are they entitled to after the waiting period? Who are they directly reporting to? And the documents they need to bring with them on the first day of employment, i.e. your things for your I-9. Okay, now <laughs> with the offer of employment letter, friendly reminder, you also cannot tell them, oh, you need to bring in a driver's license and a social security card. The I-9 is going to have a list of acceptable documents. So I just referenced that in the employment letter that it's also enclosed. They need to bring one from A or one from B and C. Um, if there are required certifications for that position, um, maybe we're in healthcare and I need a copy of their licensure or um, I need a copy of their CPR or what have you, I want copies of those certifications. Um, any sort of pre-employment authorizations and disclosures. We strongly recommend doing background and credit checks as well as pre-employment testing for drugs. Um, I know that a lot of our um, states that we operate in have uh, medicinal marijuana or legalized marijuana to a certain degree. However, you should still be doing pre-employment drug testing. We should have policy and procedure on how that works if somebody has a registered medical card. OK, um, but remember, we can't do pre-employment checks until a conditional offer of employment is on the table. That could be verbal and or in writing, but they still have to sign the authorization for you to run those. A lot of organizations can get themselves into hot water if they're trying to check references before they even make an offer or they're saying, mm, take this drug test. If you pass, we'll give you the job or or excuse me, let me rephrase that. Um, if you pass, then we'll offer you, make you an offer for a job. So um, in the employment letter, the offer letter, um, those things should always be contingent. Right. So this offer is contingent upon successful completion of references, background, drug tests, so on and so forth. Um, every organization should have job descriptions. Those job descriptions should be broken out into essential and non-essential functions. They should be signed and dated by the employee. That is a best practice as well as it is a necessary onboarding tool. 
Um, so while we're talking about job descriptions, uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act is going to want to look at essential versus non-essential. Why? Because if I have 15 or more employees, um, I'm going to be subject to the ADA, which means if somebody has a physical or a mental disability and they cannot perform the essential functions of the job, I have to engage in reasonable accommodations. Okay. Um, so we want to look at the amount of time spent on the job performing certain functions. Um, and we do have the ability to determine what is essential and non-essential. Okay. Um, also things that I look for, obviously federal and state tax forms. You do not have to keep tax forms separate from the main file. You can if you really want to, but it is not a requirement. Okay. Um, also, all states are required to engage in new hire reporting. Anybody that is hired within our organization must be filed or reported to the state within 21 days from hire. Um, that is how they track child support garnishments, tax liens, any other garnishments that may be issued by the court. OK, um, so a lot of the payroll systems will do that for you. If you are unsure, I strongly suggest that you check with your payroll provider. Um, if you're not outsourcing payroll, then you need to have an account established online through your respective state and you need to submit uh, those new hires within 21 days. Um, in a perfect world, I want to see a printout confirmation in the file that they were submitted. At the very least, if your payroll company is doing it, they should have um, some sort of records retention there for you if you need to access it to show that you have complied with state new hire reporting. We're also looking for signed employee handbook receipts. Um, if you don't have a handbook in place for your organization, you absolutely need to get one. Um, because there are certain things required by law that need to be in policy. And I'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, any other pre-employment checks per your industry and or state regulation? Um, you know, for example, healthcare workers have to run OIG exclusion lists. They need to do credentialing. Um, if you are in transportation, um, there may be DOT clearances or separate DOT files that we have to run. So any other pre-employment checks that are specific to your industry should also be in that file, assuming they're not medically related, um, associated with their also uh, their signed authorizations to run those checks. Okay. Um, now, you can set up your files uh, within the, the main file however you like. Some people like to have tabs for certain things, like general uh, employment forms, then a training section, then a performance section, so on and so forth. So um, you should have uh, records of training provided, both at orientation or, or on the onboarding process, as well as annual training, okay? Uh, some of that may be industry specific, some of that may be uh, company specific, but at the very least, everybody, regardless of how large your organization is, should be doing annual harassment and discrimination training. Um, I want to see that certain states require that it be done annually, um, but you should also have a signature page acknowledging that they attended and that they have completed the course. If you are doing an online learning management system, those systems will generate cer certifications of completion. Print those out and put them in the file. Now, if you're offering employer-sponsored benefits like health and dental and vision, um, when that individual enrolls in the plan, they should receive an initial um, COBRA notice um, if they are being offered group health. That should also go in the general personnel file. If you are using a COBRA third party administrator, you just want to ensure A, they are issuing your initial COBRA notices and B, that you have access to that records retention, again, for compliance purposes, if it's ever questioned. I'm also looking for insurance enrollments, 401k enrollments. As long as there is no health information, a health questionnaire about pre-existing conditions or blood pressure or anything like that, it can absolutely go in the general personnel file. However, 
if they are asking medically related questions in those enrollment forms, then that enrollment form needs to go in your separate medical file. Okay, same concept, short term, long term disability, 401k, for, for, you know, 35Bs, life insurance, so on and so forth. Um, performance reviews. We always recommend that you do a 30, 60, or 90 introductory review and annual thereafter. It does not have to be a huge, robust uh, review document, but um, again, this goes back to the paper trail of being able to defend why somebody is no longer with us or why they were let go, uh, that it was performance related. So those should all be in the file, and I'm looking for consecutive dates on that. I'm looking for any sort of coaching notes, uh, constructive feedback notes, verbal or written disciplinary, disciplinary notes, especially if it's a terminated employee file. I should be able to open up that file and see from start to finish how their employment progressed with you. Why were they let go? Um, were they coached? Were they verbally warned? Then they went to a written or a final written, okay? And within those notes, I'm looking for detail. I'm looking at fact versus opinion. What policy did it violate? Uh, what was the corrective action taken? What was the follow-up timeline? Did they meet it? Yes or no? Um, and was it signed and dated by the manager, which is the most important piece, okay, um, and the employee? Now, if the employee refuses to sign it, no worries there. Just um, simply denote in that write-up, employee refused to sign, which is why it's very helpful to have a witness in the room when we're doing disciplinary conversations, okay? Um, any sort of awards or special achievements, commendations, those would be in there. Um, new hire checklist, just making sure we've dotted all of our I's and crossed our T's on onboarding or forms that are required for employment, training checklists, those sorts of things I would be looking for, as well as, again, if it's a separated employee, is there a formal separation of employment note? It's a form. Um, some states require you, um, Tennessee, for example, requires you to notify them in writing why they were separated. Um, Virginia and other states do not require that, but best practice is to have a separation of employment form in the file. It's similar in concept to a write-up. Why are they being let go? What led up to that termination? Um, manager signed it, employee signed it, or employee refused to sign. Uh, exit interviews are very, very helpful, but you got to get them in real time. Don't try to send an exit interview via email or, or regular snail mail because you'll never get it completed. Um, so, you know, if somebody's resigning, certainly you can schedule that ahead of time. Um, and then we're also looking for COBRA notices within 30 days of their separation. Again, if you're outsourcing that, you want to make sure that you have access to it. Um, any sort of information regarding benefit rollovers, um, final paychecks. Um, now, remember, with final paychecks, that, that's going to be dependent upon state wage payment regulation. Some states require the check to be ready for them, their last day of work, um, and many others only require it to be provided on the next scheduled pay date. Okay, so separation of employment, I'm looking for the whole the whole gamut on that as well. Okay. Questions or comments about the general personnel file? Let me look at the QA here one second. Let's see. Um, question from one of our attendees, should payroll docs, direct deposit liens, child support verification, et cetera, be stored separately or can they be in the general personnel file? Wonderful question. Direct deposit, child support garnishments, tax liens, all of that can go in the general personnel file. You do not have to keep that separate. So thank you for that question. Okay. Let's go. Let's move into separate medical files. So remember, anything medically related, anything with a diagnosis, workers' comp, FMLA, ADA, drug test results, um, workers' comp can go in one main 
um, medical file, but a lot of organizations prefer to keep workers' comp pieces separate. That's fine, but remember, workers' comp claims still have to be maintained per employee, not in one lump sum workers' comp file. Same concept with OSHA, okay? Um, so separate drawer, separate filing cabinet, separate file folder in your HRIS, under lock and key, password protected or physically locked. Nobody should have access to that medical information except for your designated HR individual. Why? Because under FMLA, ADA, uh, we want to make sure that managers aren't gaining knowledge of medical conditions that could potentially lead us down a discrimination path, whether that be a verbal comment or different treatment because of a medical condition. Okay. I mentioned earlier that we should maintain separate I-9 files. You can do that in a binder, in a folder, in a different drawer. Again, different folder within your HRIS system. Uh, but we want to keep those separate from the general personnel file. Why? Because almost every single one of your I-9s, if I were to really dig into it, is going to have an error on it somewhere. Okay. The I-9 form is either 100% correct or it is 100% wrong. Um, and that's how the USCIS looks at it. So we always recommend sorting by active and inactive, okay? Because after they have been inactive for one full year from their last date of employment, technically you can destroy those inactive I-9s, okay? Um, if you were copying the documents that they present based off of the list of acceptable documents, those copied um, items must stay with the completed form. You can staple them to the completed I-9, but don't let them float around in that general personnel file. Um, some common mistakes that we see is that there are three dates that need to match. Section one, that the employee completes in the certification um, underneath the list A, B, and C, and where the employer signs. Um, those need to match, okay? At the very least, section one, where the employee signs, can't be any more than three days, three days from when the employer verifies and certifies that the documents are correct, okay? Um, I often find the wrong documents in the wrong list or a document that wasn't even able to be accepted. Um, putting a social security uh, card in a list B or a birth certificate in a list B is not correct. Um, Failing to recertify a list A document, like a passport and or a visa upon the expiration um, is going to be an issue. Um, so, or sometimes I see people fill out the recertification because they're getting uh, a new driver's license because the driver's license expired. You don't have to recertify or re-verify when a driver's license expires. Um, also, I run into the list of acceptable documents not being maintained or retained with that form. It needs to stay with the form. Okay. Um, all right, let's talk a little bit about records retention. We get a lot of questions at Seth go about, Jamie, how long do I have to keep these, these files? Um, and it depends on the regulation. It depends on the type of file. Um, so if we're talking about OSHA, your injury logs must be maintained for a minimum of five years following the injury. Um, your OSHA 300A logs, five years after it was reported. Now, here, here's a shocking one. Um, any post-termination for an employee medical record that was exposed under OSHA needs to be maintained for up to 30 years. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, Jamie, that's a little crazy. Why in the world would 25 years ago or, you know, I need to keep these files? Well, um, I can tell you from experience at Sesco that we have had situations arise where OSHA has requested copies of medical records from an exposure 26 years later, um, and the employer did not have them. They had already destroyed those records. And so OSHA dinged them on noncompliance for records retention. 
Okay. So OSHA, uh, minimum of five years for the logs and up to 30 years for medical records uh, associated with that exposure. Fair Labor Standards Act, FLSA, um, wages, hours, working conditions, you need those at least for three years. Okay. Because if you get audited, if you get audited, they're going to pull at minimum two years of all time, time cards, pay plans, commission plans, um, and payroll records. However, if you've been audited before and they're coming back, they're going to ask for three years. Okay. Um, so you want to, best rule of thumb, just keep them for three years. Um, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 64 and age discrimination and employment. Um, looks at affirmative action records, EEO, and non-discrimination for one year post-employment action or, or after an EEO charge of discrimination. Um, so let's say I terminated an employee and they came back 300 days um, and filed a charge of discrimination and it took us six months to, to get it settled out with the EEOC. Okay, so your one year starts after it was settled out. Okay. If you are an affirmative action employer, meaning you have federal contracts or you are, are a subcontractor of an employer that has federal contracts, then you're going to need to keep all of your records for your AAP, your affirmative action program, and that's for two years. So, Hiring, firing, changes in status, job descriptions, any union contracts, if you're subject to a collective bargaining agreement. Um, you're going to also have to keep things for Davis-Bacon with wages, um, benefits, all of those things, okay? Um, because if you have an AAP, you all are familiar with the fact that we've got to track everybody, everybody from start to finish. What code are they? What type of employee are they? What their wages were? Because you have to do your um, compliance action plan as a contractor or subcontractor. If you have 50 or more employees and are a FMLA subject employer, you need to keep all of those records for three years. That's going to include any sort of requests for leave, approval or denial letters, tracking of time, the dates and the hours of the leave that they took, the benefit information during the leave, including payment or non-payment for their portion of the premiums, um, and what happened after FMLA? Did they return? Did we have to extend them under an ADA leave of absence? Did we issue COBRA? Okay, so you have to keep those for three years. Again, FMLA stuff should really go in that separate medical file. Income tax records, 15 years. Payroll and accounting information, your W-4s. Those remain in file and in effect unless an employee is changing their deductions. Okay, so um, I often get questions of, oh, should I be getting new W-4s on employees every year? No, you don't have to unless either federal law changes and or the employee wants to change their deductions. And yes, then they would need to fill out a new form, but you don't have to make them sign a new one every year. Your I-9 forms um, must be maintained three years post-hire or one year post termination, whichever is longer. Obviously, you're going to have to do one year post termination. Um, again, if you're an uh, affirmative action employer, federal contractor, or subcontractor, and you are subject to the Davis Bacon Act um, for prevailing wages, you need to keep all of those contracts, wages, hours, benefit information for three years. ERISA, if you're offering, obviously, medical and or retirement plans, you're going to be subject to ERISA. Uh, so we have to have those support filings, your 5500s, records of benefits, record of discrimination testing, all of those things. Okay, let's see if we have any questions about records retention. I don't see anything in the QA. Let me check the chat here. Lauren, I'm not seeing anything, but if for some reason you see something, let me know. Feel free to yeah. interrupt. We have two oh. questions in the um, question and answer. 
I okay. can read them out for you if you'd like. Oh, wait, they just popped up. Okay. Thank you. I was a little delayed on that. Okay. We we have a question about E-Verify. We use E-Verify. Do we need to keep a copy of the documents used? We keep a digital copy of the case processing. Yes. If you are using E-Verify, then you need to keep records and copies of those documents. That's a good question there. Um, and then Katie asked a question about the I-9 form. We must use the actual I-9 form, correct? We cannot create one in our onboarding system to use in place of the official form. That is correct. The USCIS, you must use the actual I-9 form. And we can't, you can make copies of the form I-9, but remember to always check for the expiration date on the form. It is not uncommon for me, and I should have mentioned this in that slide, to see, you know, uh, I-9 form that expired in 2018, but was used in 2024. So make sure it's still a valid form there. Right. I think those are the only other two questions that popped in. Double check the chat again. OK, perfect. All right. Let's talk about onboarding. Um, you know, onboarding is going to look a little bit different for everybody re regarding the size of your organization. Some businesses have very, very robust week long onboarding processes. Others have, you know, a few hours with the office person, um, you know, doing pre-employment paperwork and then they send them on their way to the manager. So there are a variety of ranges and approaches that organizations take. There are pros and cons with every approach and, um, you know, again, it, it's got to make sense for your organization. However, uh, most employees, when we talk about onboarding, are going to be subject to that introductory period, um, 60 days, 90 days introductory period per your policy to kind of get acclimated. Um, remember, orientation and kind of how the employee experiences their job, their coworkers, their manager, their the, the organization as a whole is gonna make or break the situation, okay? So, you know, we're hearing, it's a tough labor market out there right now anyways, but we're hearing a lot of frustration from employers about constant turnover, especially within the first 90 days. Um, and so I always kind of work and consult with these employers on, okay, well, let's talk about your onboarding process. What does that look like? Um, is it really giving them a true look at the organization? Is it really making sure that they are being set up from success? And are there touch points? Um, because as you all well know, recruitment is very expensive, it's time intensive, and it can be very frustrating when we've got you know high, high attrition, especially within the first 90 days to even first year of employment, right? We wanna make sure that we're getting our return on investment. So. You know, I, I always think it's never a bad idea to look at um, onboarding and, and doing a little bit more robust. Obviously, use that opportunity to do your company required trainings, um, have roundtable discussions with key insiders, invite, especially if you're a larger organization, invite in different department directors or department managers to come in and talk to these orientation classes about what that department does. Even if it's not their department, they still need to kind of connect the dots with the big picture because every department is relying upon the other in some form or fashion. Um, we also want to look at, you know, making sure that our frontline management is still engaging in on the job learning. Even somebody that has 20 years industry experience is still going to need on the job training and adjustment because our way of doing things may be slightly different from how their previous employers have done things, and that's okay. Um, I'm really huge into individual mentoring and making sure that new employees have great HR support and connections with HR. Um, and you may wanna consider doing field or product experiences, site visits, shadowing programs, just to set them up for success. Um, but remember, onboarding, regardless, will always have a formal and an informal process. 
Um, so, you know, when we talk about informal, employees are going to learn through observation. Um, they're going to watch how their coworkers are doing it and what the coworkers get by with. Um, they're going to use that observation and that experience to determine the culture of the organization or the culture within the department. Um, and so that often occurs without any sort of quote unquote plan in place. Okay. Um, which is why it's always important set your new hires up with your superstar employees. So, you know, people that we know have good performance, good attendance, good attitudes and behaviors so that they are informally learning the job in a positive way. Um, but then also you should have a formal onboarding plan. Again, if you're doing a multi-day orientation, then there should be a plan in place and a step-by-step -step of um, what is gonna happen in this orientation. Day one, we're gonna do X, Y, and Z, and then we're gonna do a tour, and then day two, we're gonna do A, B, and C. And we're going to introduce you to all the department directors and show you around and show you how to clock in and do benefit enrollment, all of these things. Um, so it's really about the experience. Uh, we want to combat turnover. We want to make sure that we, we use this onboarding as an opportunity to clarify those expectations, um, which helps us increase performance and motivation and morale, and that we are giving them a jump start in relationship. Still, the number one reason why employees leave organizations is not compensation, regardless of what we may we may hear from staff. It's still every nationwide survey you can Google is still talking about the number one reason is that. It's a lack of relationship, a lack of connection, whether that be with the manager, with the organization as a whole, not feeling like they're a part of the team. Uh, don't get me wrong. There are other reasons that play into turnover, wages, benefits, commute, work-life balance, all of those things. And they rank high, but the number one reason is lack of relationship. So we want to make sure that we are really focusing on that relationship as well. Um, so with onboarding, I look at four distinct levels. Obviously, our compliance piece, the pre-employment uh, forms, policies, handbook, um, all of the important things, right? And then we roll into clarification. What is our strategic plan? What is my department responsible for? What is my job description? Um, working through all of that so that they understand what their expectations are going to be. And then I roll into organizational norms for culture purposes. Um, let's talk about teamwork. Let's talk about how we expect our employees to engage with one another, the importance of customer and service uh, internally and externally. Um, and then we roll into connection really trying to cultivate and support those interpersonal relationships so, so that employees are meeting coworkers. They're meeting and, um, you know, getting to know other managers so that they feel a sense of connection there. Okay. Um, so when we have those four major uh, levers, um, that helps maximize our onboarding success. So the social integration, the knowledge of the culture, uh, the self-efficacy, -eff and our role clarity really is going to give you that short-term outcome. Um, but we also want to continue to cultivate that after the orientation period, which is why it's so important that your managers have training on how to coach, counsel, motivate, connect with their employees. It's often the soft skill that falls by the wayside. Um, and when we have that management training and that support and we have the right managers in place, that drives our long-term outcomes. Um, higher job satisf satisfaction, organizational commitment, turnover tends to be reduced. Um, career effectiveness, lower stress, those sorts of things. I'll be honest, when I see and work with organizations that have high turnover, um, the first thing that I'm looking at is the manager within that department. And we're drilling down to what's going on um, because often it is tied to management issues within that department. 
Um, so with our HR, and maybe you don't have a formal HR department, that's okay, right? Um, but there is somebody or a group of folks within your organization that is going to be responsible for the onboarding and the quote unquote HR management of it all. So, you know, with recruitment, um, interviews, orientations, all of that, there needs to be kind of a process um, for compliance purposes because recruitment can get very, very tricky with what can I ask? What can I not ask? Am I asking the same questions to every single individual? Um, who's handling orientation? What does that look like? Um, you know, we, we just want a good system and process in place. Um, are there appropriate feedback tools? Do they have uh, appropriate avenues to provide feedback to us? You know, it's not uncommon for a lot of my clients to do HR quote unquote checkpoints within that with that new employee within a 30, 60, 90 day on top of the uh, evaluation that the manager is doing. Okay, so some onboarding best practices, make sure that we've got the basics prior to the first day. Uh, make that first day, that first week, that those first couple of weeks really, really special. Again, it's all about relationship. Um, Make sure that other managers and other key stakeholders are participating in that orientation and that we're kind of keeping a pulse on what's working and what's not working in that. Um, you can certainly use technology to facilitate the process. Um, you know, a lot of these HRIS systems, they can do their pre-employment documentation before they even step foot in the door. Great but HR or the manager should still be reviewing those documents to make sure that they were completed correctly and fully and all of those great things. Um, make sure that you're using those milestones anywhere from 30 to 120 days. Do your check-ins. Uh, how's it going for them? What can we do to better support you? Where do you feel like you're struggling? Um, those are important. Okay. Um, and last but not least, I want to talk a little bit about the employee handbook. Um, it is truly a critical recruitment uh, onboarding and a core HR system for a variety of reasons. Um, there are many advantages for different parties within the organization. So for, for the business as a whole, um, we have to have policies and procedures. Um, certain things are required by law. For example, the FLSA requires that we have our standard work week defined. How is that defined? It is a 24 hour, seven day period. What day does, is it 12.01 on Sunday to 12 o'clock on Saturday? Um, that's a requirement of the FLSA because that's how we determine how overtime is going to be calculated in that work week. That should be in your employee handbook. Um, FMLA, ADA, Virginia Pregnancy, Virginia Human Rights Act, all of those things have to be in policy in your handbook. So it helps our employees understand our policies, um, uh, benefits, what's offered, and it really is intended so that that manager is following the policy and procedure consistently. That ensures that employees understand, hey, we've got fair and consistent practices, and that gives management credibility. Um, and if our managers are actually following the policy consistently, um, in theory, that's going to save us time. Why? Because we're not dealing with um, more conflict or more inconsistency behaviors or things aren't being slid by. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to micromanage things, but what you do for one, you do for them all, right? So it really is a good employee uh, an orientation tool. It should be part of the orientation process, walking through that handbook, covering um, the benefits, the policies, the expectations within the handbook, getting them to sign it. Um, and certainly it can be a very, very effective union avoidance management communication tool um, as well. Um, as I mentioned, certain uh, federal and state laws have to be in writing, so it's going to ensure that we comply with those um, and that it's helping us comply with those guidelines. And it is going to be the first thing that I ask for if you were to get a wrongful termination claim or a charge of discrimination. 
um, when we have to defend those for our clients, I want to see a copy of the handbook. I want to see where they sign for the handbook. I want to see the, the write-ups and the investigative file and all of that, because that's part of our legal defense that they violated X, Y, and Z, and that they signed acknowledgement and they had received training on this or that. Um, so those are the advantages to the employers. Now for our managers, this employee handbook should really make their lives much easier. That's their guidebook. They need to know what the policy and procedures are so that they can effectively manage and enforce. Um, it also helps them be consistent and day-to-day, -day, right? Managing our people can often be the most difficult part of leadership, but what we do for one, we want to do for them all, again, because that gives us credibility. It gives uh, the employees the perception that we're fair and the confidence that we're fair and that we're holding people accountable for their behavior. Um, the, you know, it's a great um, support system, especially for those newly promoted supervisors or a lead person um, because they may not have realized that we have specific policies in place. A lot of people don't read the handbook um, until they really need to, need to use it um, for their case. So they may skim through it when they're hired and sign off on it, but they forget what it says. So for that new supervisor, especially if something has changed in the handbook since since they were hired in, this is great for them. Um, it saves us time and it really gives common ground for that mutual understanding of what the employees are responsible for doing too. So with our actual non-supervisory employees, Again, education, orientation tool, um, maybe helpful to their family members if there's a question or concern about what benefits are being offered. Um, and it helps provide employees with that sense of self-esteem and security that they know what to expect from us as the employer. So um, when do you need to update an employee handbook? Um, so best practice, is that really it should be reviewed on an annual basis because federal and state employment laws, interpretations from the National Labor Relations Board or Department of Labor on certain policies and how things can be worded constantly changes, okay? Um, so best practices every year. If you are changing benefits or eligibility for benefits or a significant change in your PTO or now we wanna offer family paid leave and it's not required under law. Um, obviously we want to um, update that. And then if for whatever reason, and we hope we hope not, but if you become unionized, then obviously that's gonna need to be updated as well, okay? Things that we want to avoid is creating any sort of binding contract. There should be multiple references throughout that employee handbook that we are an at will employer. OK, um, things that can get us into hot water, and we see this regularly in the handbook reviews that that we get from clients nationwide in all industries um, are references that employees will be terminated only for just cause. Well, that's going to be a binding, binding language. Um, using the term probationary period in lieu of introductory period is not going to work either. Um, language such as employees may be terminated with or without cause during probationary period could be a binding contract. Um, so we want to have a progressive discipline policy, but we it needs to be worded properly where it's not going to lock us into only these things can make you subject to discipline. Okay. Um, any sort of language that would refer to job security or permanent employee status would also be a no-no. So um, again, you should have it reviewed. Now, if you're a banker's client, you can send that in to Sesco for a very, very low review fee um, by our employment attorneys. And then what that happens is we, we generate a report of findings and recommendations with a discounted fee for updates based on the amount of work that it needs. Sometimes they're teeny tiny little updates um, and it's very minimal. And then other times, honestly, they're complete rewrites. I was talking with a client yesterday um, uh, in, where were they, Georgia or Florida? Anyways, 
um, their handbook had not been updated since 1999. And I was like, well, we're going to have to just scrap that whole thing and get you a new one. Um, because there's a lot that has changed in the last 26 years. So um, anyways, so, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a formal handbook, quote unquote, committee, but a designated person, whether that be your HR person, your office manager, your, your owner, um, sometimes more eyes are better than, you know, one pair of eyes. Um, but, you know, everybody has their own opinions on what should and should not be uh, included or excluded from the handbook. Now, it's not uncommon for me to work with clients that are like, I don't want to include this. I'm like, mm, well, legally, you have to. Sorry. Um, or I push back and I say, well, this really is best practice and here's why. Um, so typically what we do is we will send an employee handbook development checklist um, and then obviously Sesco is the subject matter expert and um, we will kind of educate you on what should and should not be. But um, we use that checklist to kind of evaluate what's currently in there versus what needs to be updated on company specific pieces. Um, and then those individuals will kind of work with Sesco to walk through the first draft, second draft, make edits, ask questions. Uh, they may be collecting additional information that we need to process those edits, um, and we may be reviewing that. Again, it's it's helpful to have additional pair of eyes on it because everybody sees things um, that others may read over. So um, now, once we get it into final draft, um, obviously we need to be thinking about distribution, right? Um, distribution not only to our managers and, and kind of highlighting what has and has not changed, but then also thinking about rolling that out to um, employees because they need to sign off on the new handbook. Remember, it's one thing to have a revised or updated handbook, but if it is never redistributed um, or never re-signed for, then the then the policies that they did sign for would still be in effect in the eyes of the Department of Labor. Okay, so I run into that a lot. Yeah, we updated our handbook. I don't think I ever got Joe or Mary to sign off on the new one. Well, Joe and Mary are going to have an argument that they were operating under the old policy instead of this new one. Okay. Um, so things that should be in your employee handbook, any of your personnel policies, your benefits, working conditions, pay systems, disciplinary procedures, work rules, expectations, customer service, all of those things should be there, okay? Um, I do not recommend having a quote-unquote manager handbook. Okay, um, because the policies and procedures that pertain to management are going to pertain to your employees. Also, then that creates um, our perception, a cultural issue of, well, what does management have that we don't have? Okay, um, so any special quote unquote employee benefits that pertain only to management teams should not be included in that handbook. Anything that would be subject to change frequently, like, for example, um, referencing somebody's specific name and title in a policy. So see Joe Smith, our safety director. Well, just reference safety director, not Joe's first and last name, because Joe may not be with us five years from now or two years from now or six months from now. Okay. Um, certainly if you are a, a, a a union organization, we don't want to include any language that would could conflict with your collective bargaining agreement there either. Okay. So when we're ready to roll out, schedule those management meetings prior to distribution, walk through that, address questions, and then we schedule those group meetings. Now, you may be redistributing it electronically or through your HRAS system, make sure that there is some tracking of that and that they are signing off that they have read and received it. Okay. Um, and then make sure that that new revised handbook is given out an orientation as well. Okay. Um, I know that was kind of trial by fire and I, um, threw a lot at you in a very short amount of time, but are there any questions pertaining to core HR systems um, that I might be able to 
um, address for you. I do see a question. Can you share the handbook checklist when you send the recorded webinar? So that is a Sesco internal document for uh, project work. Um, if you're interested in having your handbook reviewed by Sesco under the banker's relationship, certainly you can email me direct and, and we can look at that process, but we don't hand out that checklist unless we are engaged to do a handbook update with that particular client. So sorry about that. Um, I do see another question that came in regarding job descriptions. Um, should the job descriptions be more generalized to the department responsibilities, not necessarily details of the specific program or services within the department? So responsibilities, coverage can be more fluid. So um, with job descriptions, I should be able to look at the job description and know exactly what that position requires. Your knowledge, skills, abilities, education, experience, um, the essential functions, why the position exists, overall functions. Um, and I want those written qualitative and quantitatively. So, um, if I am responsible for monthly auditing and reporting to my department director, um, I'm going to reference, you know, obtains data from blank system processes, complete compiles report, reviews for areas of discrepancy or concerns, creates an action plan, um, and then submits all, said all information to the director on a monthly basis. Um, so, you know, it doesn't have to be every single little daily task that they do, but the job description as a whole should really include um, every function that the position does and try to describe that as qualitative and as quantitative as we possibly can. Obviously, we always want to include other duties as assigned too. So um, great question there. Um, question about recording of this session. Yes, this session is being recorded and you will receive a copy of the recording. Um, another question came in regarding the I-9s. Do we need to track expiration dates of original documents used when hired and get renewed documents and complete the new I-9 form, like work authorization cards? So as I previously mentioned, um, in terms of re-verification, yes, you need to be tracking list A documents. Um, authorization, work authorization cards, passports, visas, that sort of thing. And yes, you will have to re-verify those pr prior to or upon expiration of that list A document. So good question there. Let's scroll up and see if I had anything else come in. Uh, Lauren, are you saying anything else? Um, we have one more question that asked, do we need to add the E-Verify case number on the I-9 form? No, never write on the I-9 form unless it is in a, uh, in the sections that you are required to write on. No, the E-Verify case, um, again, separate printout and keep that um, separate documentation, but never write on the I-9 form um, in areas where we're not supposed to write. Good question on that one. Okay, anything else? I don't see any more questions. All right, very good. Well, um, if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out to Sesco and we'd be more than happy to assist. Um, however, if you email and or call in, please let us know if you are a banker's client. Um, so that we can track that with our call logs and email records. But um, otherwise, thank you so much for the opportunity to present today. I hope everybody has a great day and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Jamie. Have a great day, everyone.